now I get to stand before you like I did last year, and this is the greatest privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Cindy Gallup. And you know, I, she and I were talking last night, and she has such a storied career. And all of you, it's like you can't not know who she is. So I thought I don't want to waste time talking about all the places she's worked. But I will tell you that I was in New York recently, and Cindy and I went out to dinner. And at one point during dinner, I said to her, "Which side of the creative um, group did you start out at? Were you a writer or were you an art director?" And she said. I'm an account person. <laughs> and it was almost like finding out the tooth fairy wasn't real. I was like, I think I might have even said, you're a suit? You know, like I just couldn't believe. Uh, she's such a creative force. And it's so wonderful to see where she's applying her energies these days. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have watched her famous TED Talk. But she is really questioning the world and how pornography is changing the way, especially our kids, are learning about sex. It's such an important dialogue. And I'm, I admire her so much because it's a hard thing to talk about. And she's talking about it. Um, so anyway, she's one of the top 100 women in ad age. I, I would say she's the top five. And she's here today to challenge us to be the change you want to see. Please welcome Cindy Gallup. Can I get my slides up, please? Um, guys, I'm thrilled to be here um, with all of you again. And we stand at the start of a really phenomenal two-day program of extraordinary speakers, amazing topics, and lots of really useful and actionable insights and advice. So I want to keep this opening talk extremely simple. I'm just going to talk about why we're all here today and what we want each and every one of you in this room to actually take away and do in the course of the next two days and when you leave here um, at the end of Thursday. Um, before I do that, uh, just um, three things up front. Um, the first is, everything I'm going to say today about gender in our industry also applies to race and, race and ethnicity. Everything I'm talking about is about diversity in its totality. For the purposes of this conference, I'm focusing on gender, but I really want you all to bear that in mind. Um, the second thing is, everything I'm talking about today applies to our industry advertising. It applies to every creative industry, and it applies to every industry, full stop. So I know there are some of you um, who've come from other industries beyond our own. Um, actually, Everything that you will see in here today and engage with and talk about is applicable to the world of business as a whole. And I would love all of you to bear that in mind and also to spread the applicability of this conference to everybody who works in any form of business anywhere. And the third thing is I am absolutely thrilled to see the men in the audience. Well bloody done because you are on the inside track to the future. And again, everything I'm talking about, I'm directing at the men and women in our industry and our business. Everything I'm talking about applies to everybody. So the reason we're here is the future of advertising is gender equal. And note, I don't say the future of advertising should be gender equal. I say it is gender equal. And that's because... If advertising does not get itself to gender equality, we don't have a future. And in fact, that's true of business, again, in totality. The future of business is gender equal for three reasons. Because of money, because of culture, and because of winning. I um, attended a very large tech conference last year where a venture capitalist, the VC, gave a talk about branding in the tech venture and startup world. And um, which, by the way, is always quite entertaining because our world and the world of tech does not currently overlap sufficiently. There is a huge amount that we could all be doing to work more effectively with each other. Um, but it's always entertaining to hear the tech world talk about branding. And so this was um, a relatively simplistic presentation. And I'm not naming names because actually the guy who gave it is a friend and I like him. Um, but, he, but he talked about um, three approaches to, to how you might brand a venture. And the third approach was niche branding, niche targeting. 
um, where you know, he explained you basically focus your brand and you target your startup, your venture, at a small niche audience. And the examples he gave, that there was um, on, uh, bullet points on the slide, and then below this third bullet point, a list of examples. So examples of niche um, marketing and targeting were African-American, Hispanic, women. <laughs> we weren't even number one on that list of niche markets. But that very unfortunate thinking reflects the thinking in our industry, which for centuries, for decades has been, you advertise to everybody, but fundamentally that means you're advertising to men. And when you advertise to women, it's a specialist thing. And that is no longer the case. We are not a subset, we are the norm. And so the three reasons why the advertising industry will make a shed load more money, and the world of business will make a shed load more money, if they really understand that we are the norm, are women buy. We are the majority of purchasers in every single product sector. We're the majority of influencers of purchase in every single product sector, including sectors that historically were thought to be male. Women influence 90% of all electronics purchasing decisions here in the US. Women influence 60% of all car buying decisions. We are the ones who are buying. Women share. The vast majority of users of social media are women. Women today are actually the majority of gamers, if you factor in social gaming. And women are the majority of people who express themselves through digital personas online. And that's because all social media is doing is giving us a way to do everything we've always done since the world began. We share. Um, women connect and communicate through sharing experiences, through creating intimacy immediately. If you go into any social gathering, any business gathering where there is small talk and chit chat going on up front, the men will be talking sports results and the women will be sharing things that they experience themselves to get to a closer and more intimate connection. So we share the shit out of everything. <laughs> and marketers need to realize that because men do not do it to the same extent. And finally, women do. We act. We get stuff done, we make stuff happen. And so I actually say, um, because I advise a lot of startups and, and tech ventures, but I also say this to brands, it doesn't actually matter who your target audience is. It doesn't matter if you're a brand that is a male product for a male audience, speak to women. Whatever you're doing, target women, because you will get better business results and you will make more money when you target women. We're not a subset, we are the norm. Men are the niche audience today. <laughs> there is a huge amount of money to be made out of taking women seriously, and our industry needs to understand that. Um, the second reason we're here today is culture. So um, I um, gave a number of awards at the One Show um, a few months back um, in New York. And, and so I was, I was there in the audience at the start of the One Show. And the One Show did what awards shows do, which is they opened um, the event by playing a video edit of clips from all of the winning TV video ads um, that were going to be awarded in the course of the evening. I was probably... Um, I think it's safe to say the only person in the audience who would have noticed that 95% of that quite lengthy video edit featured men in heroic, exciting, dynamic, adventurous, aspirational, glamorous, energetic scenarios. 5% of that reel, of that edit, featured women. And it featured women as the mother, the girlfriend, the sidekick. The difference was extraordinary. When 97% of all creative directors here in the US are men, we as women are being played back to ourselves through the male gaze. And that is not good for society. It's not good for social cultural influences. It's not good for any of you. It's not good for your daughters. And it's not good for your sons. Actually, um, uh, about, I think, a week or so later, I went to London. Um, I, or it might have been before this. And I spoke at the Women in Advertising Communications London annual meeting, which is called Gather. And that was a female 
um, audience um, like this, and they played a video edit at the start of that conference. And their video edit was women, and it was women in dynamic, exciting, adventurous, aspirational, energetic roles, and the difference couldn't have been more pronounced. So from a cultural perspective, we're here because the new creativity is female informed. Our industry desperately needs a new approach to creativity and it's women. And because of that, the new creativity is real. The decades of stereotypes are over. When you create a gender equal approach to our creative product, you create a very different form of communication that taps into fundamental human truths and emotions that are real. And this is a subject I would love to talk a lot more on. I don't have time today, but um, there is absolutely a new approach to creativity coming out of a gathering like this. Because at the moment, it doesn't matter how many female creatives there are, if you are always presenting work to, and it's being judged to, a series of male creative directors, then the work that comes out the other end is not the work that is as innovative and disruptive and surprising and compelling and communicating as hard to us as women as it could be. And, um, and the third reason is winning. So um, a few weeks ago, it was Advertising Week in New York, um, which I attended. Um, how, ma how many of you were at Advertising Week in New York? A, a few of you guys. So um, I went to the um, Advertising Week opening lunch on the Monday. And I sat in a room where um, the highlight of the lunch was a panel on stage of three white men talking about the future industry. And um, again, I'm not going to name names because I know all these men and I like them. One of them has been a really fantastic influence on my career as an entrepreneur, another one I'm very fond of. But um, we're sitting there, and these three guys, and, and, and they're all very bright guys, but they were being really, really boring. <laughs> and I was sitting in the audience being really bored, <laughs> as was the rest of the audience. There were a lot of women in that audience, and I knew they were bored too. Um, but we live with this because it's the norm. We frequently sit in gatherings, in meetings, at conferences, listening to white guys boring us. <laughs> um, so they bored us, um, and, then, and, and, and then it was open for Q&A. So three white guys asked questions, <laughs> which were equally boring questions, and they got really boring answers. And I asked a question, and I didn't want to ask a question. Um, I had no particular interest in the answer because I knew I wouldn't get the kind of answer that I would like to get. But I asked the question because I just said to myself, there has got to be a female voice in this room somehow. And if nobody else is supplying it, then I'm going to stand up and supply it. So I asked a question, which um, one of them answered, but he didn't answer the question. He talked at a tangent. The next day, another one of the guys who was on that stage said to me, Cindy, that was a brilliant question. But nobody answered it. That, in a microcosm, is exactly what goes on too often in our industry. And that's what all of you here and all of us have to change. Because women innovate. So um, the day after that really boring session, I went to a lunch at which I ran into, very happily, Susan Cradle. Is Susan here, by the way? Are you in the audience, Susan? Not as yet. I know she's talking later. Right. So, um, so Susan and I were chatting. and. We were talking about Advertising Week, and she felt the same way I did. And in five minutes of conversation, Susan made three or four phenomenal observations about what should be being discussed at Advertising Week and what our industry should do that absolutely blew me away. And, and in fact, um, she'd been doing the same thing just the Saturday before Advertising Week when I moderated a panel at the Women Inspiration um, Enterprise Conference, which was composed of Susan, of Sarah Thompson of Droga 5, and Jackie Jantos, ex of Coca-Cola, who now works at Spotify. And that was a panel that everyone in our industry should have heard, because it was women talking about how you take the business forward and the future of the industry. But those voices aren't being heard. And if that voice had been on the stage at the lunch I attended, those men would have gotten more interesting because of the nature of the conversation. Um, 
Susan did um, then something that is classically female, and I'm going to come on and talk about this. So I said to her, oh, my God, Susan, those insights are amazing. I want you to write a blog post immediately, you know, and, and, and let's get it placed in ad age. And Susan went, oh, no, no, uh, no, Cindy, I'm not ready yet. I, I think I need to just work through these. I need to test them out. No! <laughs> I'm going to come on to that point. But women innovate. Women challenge the status quo because we are never it. And that's why I say to everybody in our industry, if you want to do one single thing right now to set your business on the path to innovation and disruption, to blow a breath of fresh air through everything you do, just go back to your agency, go back to your company, identify every area within it that is all male or male-dominated, change that. Just doing that one thing that you can do instantly will instantly set your business on a more innovative and disruptive path than it has been. Women innovate. If you start an ad agency today with an all-male founder leadership team, you're screwed. <laughs> you cannot afford to do that. And I'm astounded by the fact that week after week in Stuart Elliott's advertising column in the New York Times, and, and obviously I only see the New York Times, so I'm sure this is replicated in all of the cities around the country that all of you come from, you know, there is whoopee new startup agency all male founding team, again and again and again, usually, by the way, all white male founding team, which is another big mistake. Seriously, men, you don't notice this, but if you start up agencies with all female founding teams, you will not own the future. With all male founding teams, you will not own the future. Fact of life. The other reason that um, women are about winning is because women notice. Women notice things that men don't. They notice things that men will never think of. And I'm talking as much about the culture within your agency, about the way people interact with each other, about relationships. It's not a truism that ours is a people business. Women notice things about people and how to get people to work together more effectively that absolutely pass men by, because it's, it's not fundamental to the way they operate in the same way that it is to us. And that's just a fact of life. So we need women to define the future of our business because women notice the things that will help us have a successful, healthy, very financially lucrative future. And women get shit done. <laughs> when Beyonce said, girls run the world, she wasn't kidding. She does all the things he doesn't like to do so he can focus on what he likes. <laughs> How many times have you seen that dynamic play out in your company or in relationships, in marriages, in friendships, in life? That is a quote from the Fortune Most Powerful Women article about Sheryl Sandberg's relationship with Mark Zuckerberg. Lucky old Mark. And in fact, um, men, when you realize the benefit of promoting women into the leadership team, you can have a really easy life. Because the fact of the matter is that there are a lot of women who are absolutely bloody brilliant, who are very happy to do the job and to stay out of the limelight while the man in front of them absolutely is the front person, the spokesperson, gets all the press coverage. Some men in our industry realize that. They realize how lucky they are, and they've absolutely rewarded and promoted the women accordingly. And the utterly brilliant Sarah Thompson at Droga 5 and the Droga 5 male leadership team are an example of that. But too many men don't realize that, that actually having women at the top of your company can really help you in terms of making sure you can count 100% on things happening operationally, and you can do the stuff that you would really like to do. And while we're talking about women who get shit done, how about Kat Gordon? I want, to, I, want to, I want to take a moment just to say, as I said last year, our industry has been talking about the lack of women in creative departments and creative leadership for years and years and years. Nobody has ever done anything about it until Kat Gordon did. It took a woman to challenge the status quo and make shit happen. Thank you, Kat. So, how can all of us help CAT? So, these are your micro-actions. 
These are the things that I want each and every one of you to do in the course of the next two days and when you leave um, this hotel and you leave San Francisco to go back to your agencies. The first is call it out. The mantra of activism in any area is if nobody speaks up, nothing changes. Call it out. Every time you see something happening in the course of your daily working life, where men dominate in a way that they shouldn't, every time you see a conference with an all-male or predominantly male speaker lineup, every time you walk into a room and your male junior account manager has taken the power seat at the table that you should be sitting in, call it out. <laughs> and by the way, you can, you can call it out in a whole variety of ways. I'm not talking about being strident. I'm not talking about being angry. Um, I'm just talking about pointing it out because sexism and bias is all too often completely unconscious. We live in a world where the default setting is always male. Men don't notice and often women don't notice as well. And um, I want to share with you a, a great example of, of calling it out in a very constructive way um, from my friend Teresa, who is one of the wonderful women that I know on a fantastic thing called The List. All of you go to the list, as in T-H-E-L-I dot S-T. This was started by Rachel Sklar and Glynis McNichol. I won't tell you about it now, but trust me, just sign up. You'll be glad you did. And um, we, we talk on the list about all of these issues, and some time ago, we were sharing um, a number of research studies that demonstrate that um, the minute that women begin negotiating salaries or negotiating anything, something we, we generally find very hard to do, both men and women like them less. The moment you, if you negotiate as a man, good on you. You're tough, you're a go-getter, you're exactly what the business needs. If you negotiate as a woman, whoa, nobody likes you. And so Teresa was interviewing for a job, which was going extremely well, um, and so they'd reached the stage where they'd made, they'd made an offer, and the next meeting was the negotiation. And so Teresa sat down with them, and um, she said, right, you know, um, I just wanted to um, put some on the table right up front. Um, I'm about to start negotiating. And research studies have shown that the moment I begin negotiating, you're going to like me less. So I just thought I'd get that right out in the open, right up front, and now let's start. <laughs> call it out. There are many ways to call it out. And you have to call it out because you have to break the closed loop of white guys talking to white guys about other white guys. <laughs> and if you don't call it out, this is not going to change. You owe it to all of us, you owe it to yourselves, you owe it to your daughters, and you owe it to your sons. Your second micro-action, put yourself forward. I want to quote a great woman called Maggie Fox here who said, women who don't self-promote are letting us down. And you are. Um, Maggie um, is a social media expert, and she's just taken a job as head of digital at SAP. And she's absolutely right. Put yourself forward. If you don't do that, you are letting us all down. Um, I was very entertained by the fact that on Monday, a, um, a venture capitalist in New York um, put out a call for the fact that he'd been talking to a number of um, tech ventures who were targeting women um, with their product, and they desperately needed women to sit on their advisory boards. They needed women who were great at marketing to consumers. And so I put the call out on the list and, and to all my acquaintance, and I cannot tell you the number of women who emailed me back off the list and went, um, Cindy, I really want to put myself forward for this, but I mean, you know, do you think that's okay if I nominate myself, and do you think I'm good enough anyway? And here's my resume, and please have a look at... For God's sake, which is what I said to them. You know, um, oh, and I said, go ahead and nominate yourself, particularly because we, like everybody else, had been creating a shitstorm around the fact there are no women on Twitter's board. And I went, you cannot complain about no women on the board of Twitter, and then not jump all over an opting like this when it presents itself. So... This one woman who was super qualified said, oh, okay, um, I'm going to CC you on my email to him just for courage. So she did. And so I was able to see the answer, which arrived within three minutes, which said, thank you so much. Um, when are you free for breakfast or lunch? I can meet you. And he was all over it. Put yourself forward. The third point 
Third microaction, and this is a bit of a bigger topic, but it can absolutely be approached by microactions, is redesign the business. Now, I deliberately, when I said, as your second microaction, put yourself forward, I did not say lean in. <laughs> Although, obviously, in theory, I could be talking about the same thing. Um, I didn't say that deliberately because I am all for the lean in movement, but the lean in movement is about how women can win while working within the existing corporate structure and the existing system and the existing world of business. And I don't want you to do that, I want you to redesign it. Because business is a male-centric construct. Business has built up for centuries around a male leadership model of command and control, around male business values, and by the way, that's entirely understandable because for centuries, we were not allowed to do it. We were not allowed to work. But the future is about gender equal business. It's about complementing that with a female leadership model, about collaboration, consensus building, community, and female business values. The entire corporate system, as, as we know it and see it and work in it every day, the entire business structure of your agency, the entire corporate system of every single company was built on the concept of the housewife. The entire corporate structure grew up around the belief decades ago, centuries ago, that it would always be men who went to work and there would always be a woman at home taking care of everything. That's no longer the case, but the system hasn't changed. And so I get very frustrated when people talk about the lack of women um, in leadership as being a function of the fact that, oh, you know, they fell off the mommy track. Yes, it's absolutely true that women find it hard, difficult to combine family with business. That's because women shoulder an unfair share of family duties, but it's also because the very nature of business is designed for men. And so, not only is it not easy to balance those things, but quite frankly, you know, what woman does not take a look at the upper echelons of her agency, of her company, and go, who the hell would want to get up there and work like that? <laughs> and I know that because when I left BBH back in 2005, I was very flatteringly approached by everybody to come and work for them, holding companies, big agencies, and I absolutely took all of those meetings, and I came away going, I can never do that. I don't want to work there. I don't want to work in that environment, doing what you need to do in that environment in order to survive and succeed. And so your third microaction is, in everything you do, redesign the business around the way that we would like to work. And that may sound like a very big blanket call to action, but actually, everything starts with a microaction. Take a tiny project, take a bite-sized chunk of your workload, decide how you would like to make it work, redesign it, do that, have it gain traction, point to it as a case study of how doing things differently works. Because Marissa Levy and Joanna Wren would not have done that deal. Our industry needs to redesign everything about the way it does business. And the way that we want to do business is a really great model and a template for how you can change things. To create an industry that men, you will be much, much happier working and living in. Fourth microaction, tweet the fucking shit out of this conference. Guys, we want this hashtag to dominate every single person in our industry's Twitter stream. Advertising Age are holding their CMO strategy summit on the floor above us at exactly the same time. Kat Gordon asked Ad Age to send a reporter to come and cover this conference. They declined. They said they couldn't. They were too busy. Our industry does not take this conference seriously enough at the moment, and we want them to. So we want to drown everybody's Twitter timeline, everybody's Twitter feed, have everybody going, what is this 3% conference? So tweet the fucking shit out of it. All day, every day, today and tomorrow. And my correction number five is, for everything you learn over the next two days, ask yourself, what's your micro action? What are you going to do about this? How can you take what you've just heard and translate it into something that will impact your working life, 
your agency, the industry as a whole for the better. Um, I, I live my own business philosophies and beliefs. And um, I, have a, I have a startup called If We Ran the World, which you can find at ifwerantheworld.com. That is about um, helping to redesign the future of business, which is something I'm passionate about. Um, I believe the business model of the future is shared values plus shared action equals shared profit. Financial profit and social profit. This is the business model that I would like our industry to adopt. And what I mean by that is, um, too many brands' marketing programs at the moment are focused on co-creation. It's all about getting your audiences to create content and share it. I believe the future is co-action. Brands and consumers micro-acting together to create impacts in the real world that benefit consumers, benefit society, and benefit the brand and its business. But this business model works for everything. And so I'm highlighting it today particularly because the future of our industry is about men and women together sharing the same values, taking the same shared action to get to an industry and a business and shared profit, both general and personal, that is about financial and social benefit to all of us. Because happiness is gender equal. And so we already have co-education. Let's have gender co-action. Let's all act together to create a better future because the best of all possible worlds is one that men and women build equally, 50-50, and none of us have yet had the chance to live in that world, but all of us are going to love living it. Now, um, somebody asked me yesterday um, if I was going to talk about sex this morning, um, and I wasn't, but I think I have to. Um, so I just want to end um, by sharing something with you that I hope um, uh, our wonderful community manager, curator Sarah Beale, won't mind. Um, and, and by the way, before I do that, I'm going to put myself forward. Um, one micro action. If you like what I've said today, please support me and my team. Take one more micro action. Go to makelovenotporn.tv, sign up, rent one video. Do that for us. Um, and do it in the course of today, by the way, because it doesn't matter what comes up on your screen because everybody will know what that's about. And by the way, if you have no idea what Make Love Not Porn is, just go and do it anyway. You'll soon find out. <laughs> um, but um, in the course of working on makelovenotporn.tv, which is a user-generated, crowdsourced um, video sharing platform that celebrates real-world sex, our tagline is pro-sex, pro-porn, pro-knowing the difference. Um, as a team, we sit around um, sharing um, our own sex lives because our own experiences have absolutely fed into how we've designed and how we operate this venture. So Sarah and I were having a chat one day. Sarah is Madam Curator on Make Love Not Porn. She's 29. She's fantastic. She is, as I regularly tell her, an internet meme waiting to happen. And when you go to Make Love Not Porn and our blog at talkabout.makelovenotporn.tv, you'll see what I mean. But anyway, so, so Sarah and I were talking um, off, off the back of you know, something we're working on. And she told me about the time when, this is you know, a number of years ago when she was a, much younger, um, in her teens, and she had a boyfriend. Um, this is very early on in her sex life, and so she and her boyfriend were having sex, and you know, um, they were madly in love, and it was great sex, but um, he was coming and she wasn't. You know, every time they had sex, he had an orgasm and she didn't. And she was, she was thoroughly enjoying this relationship, but um, after about a year of being together, um, she finally had an orgasm. And it was, as we all know, utterly, utterly sensational, wonderful, fabulous, you know, et cetera. But she said to me that what that made her think was, so this is what he gets to experience every single time, and I haven't. <laughs> and that was a revelation. Sarah found at a relatively young age that gender equality is a very good thing in every single aspect of life. <laughs> and so it's our turn to feel what men feel all the time. <laughs> and by the way, Make Love Not Porn is absolutely about ensuring that in that area of our lives as well. But quite seriously, you know, it's our turn to experience everything that men experience. And by the way, I'm not saying men have it easy, but we just love to have only the same problems instead of a whole set of additional ones. And so please, as we go forward with the morning's program, 
As I say, everything you see, everything you hear, take it away, act on it, and take it out to the rest of the industry. Everybody from every city, um, Kat highlighted, and by the way, Kat, you missed out one, Minneapolis. I think Minneapolis is dying to get on board. So please you know, make what the 3% conference stands for happen across America and around the world so that the whole idea of this conference is every year the name should change. Next year, this has got to be at least the 4% conference. <laughs> if not the 5%, we have to get this to the 50% conference a damn sight more quickly than something like the UN Millennium Goals or Ending World Poverty. You know, we should be able to do that. So please do everything you can to help. Thank you very much.